Słuchasz podcastu Angielski z Konradem. Jeśli chcesz popracować nad płynnością, nabrać odwagi do konwersacji, skorygować często popełniane błędy, bądź poznać skuteczne metody nauki, ta audycja jest dla Ciebie. Remember, you're not at school, so chill out, kick back and enjoy yourself. Let's begin. Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Angielski z Konradem. I hope you are well, ready and willing to learn. Enjoy the show. For this episode, most words in the vocabulary section come in two varieties. British English and American English. Both have the exact same meaning, but it's worth knowing both varieties to avoid confusion. The first word comes from American English, the second one from British English. Let's begin. A hood. A hood. A bonnet. A bonnet. Maska samochodu. A trunk. A trunk. A boot. A boot. Klapa bagażnika. A junkyard. A junkyard. A scrap heap. A scrap heap. Złomowisko. A turn signal. A turn signal. An indicator. An indicator. Kierunkowskaz. A lemon. A lemon. Grat. Nie pochlebnie o samochodzie w złym stanie. Today's story begins in February last year, during my paternity leave. Me and Karolina ran into an issue. Who takes the car? The question was looming pretty much every single day. I wanted to take Ula on a trip or to run errands. Karolina wanted to go horse riding after an exhausting day at work. Both valid reasons, but it would mean that one of us had to stay in the city. So, I started looking for a second vehicle. I had some modest savings, enough to buy something decent, or so I thought. Over the years, I owned a few Volkswagens. Not the most breathtakingly beautiful automobiles, but they had a reputation as reliable, cheap-to-run vehicles. At least they used to be known as such. My knowledge of automobiles was quite limited back then. My dad tried to make me catch the mechanic bug, but to no avail. For the first time, I went to check out and potentially purchase a car all by myself, without anybody's help or guidance. I went to check out the car in the afternoon, during daytime. I met with the son of the owner, who turned out to be a kind elderly lady a retired nurse. Uh, he let me check the car out and take it for a test drive. All seemed fine. The silver polo ran, turned and braked okay. It had a few car park dents, granted, but no major issues to speak of. I spoke to the lady, not that she had anything noteworthy to say as a laywoman, as a person who doesn't know a thing about cars. Uh, we exchanged pleasantries and struck a deal. That would be the end of the story if I hadn't ignored several red flags. Let's go through them, shall we? Red flag number one. It just needs. If the seller tells you that the car just needs X part to be replaced or Y maintenance job to be carried out, 
then it usually means there's a lot more work to be done. The seller told me that the car just needed one cheap part. Very easy to replace. Just a few minutes of work and you're done. Oh, and an oil change. And air conditioning needs to be refilled. You might also want to replace a few suspension parts while you're at it. The car is humming loudly at speed, so old bearings also need to go. Also, brakes are quite weak, so you might want to look into that. Turned out it needed quite a lot more parts and work than just this one part the seller mentioned. If you don't mind getting your hands dirty, it's not a big deal. Red flag number two. I don't trust mechanics. Okay. I can understand not everyone is willing to do any maintenance themselves out of fear that they will ruin something. That's what car mechanics are for, right? Only the lady told me she doesn't trust them and she didn't look like she would do any maintenance herself. Let's take an oil change for example. Oil change is something you are supposed to do every year to keep the car happy. Picking the wrong oil, putting too much or too little of it might result in a disaster. If you do it yourself, you are responsible for anything wrong happening down the road. Sometimes it's best to leave it to someone with sufficient know-how. So you are left with two options. Do the work yourself or have it done for you. Choosing neither spells trouble. That's what the old lady decided to do. Neither. She had some bad experiences with dodgy mechanics. I know the type. The one that takes the most expensive way to fix quite a cheap issue, the type that suck their customers dry. It isn't easy to find a trustworthy mechanic. I had a few unpleasant experiences when one of my cars badly broke down and I had no choice but to get it to a quote-unquote specialist. He took a lot of cash, replaced a few parts but the problem persisted still. He was also a bit rude and a little smelly, but <laughs> but that's beside the point. You either have car maintenance done for you or you do it yourself. Red flag number three. Rusty brakes and or moss. Rusty brakes mean that the car hasn't been driven for a while. It may be a week, it may be half a year. Cars are a bit like people in that regard. They are meant to be moved. If they aren't moved, then some issues might pop up related to lack of movement. A dead battery, for example. Fuel system might get clogged not to mention deteriorating fluids, petrol included, petrol also deteriorates, it loses its qualities. Moss is also an indicator of the car being left unused. Apart from forests, it also likes to grow on rubber parts, seals, tires and so on. It takes a lot more time for moss to start growing than rust on brake discs, so be mindful of that. The car had some moss spots, so it may have been sitting in a shed for a year for all I know. I decided to ignore it. Not a very smart move. Red flag number four. I get a lot of calls about the car, also known as 
your number X on the list. To drive a potential customer to a false sense of urgency. That's a common advertising strategy, not uncommon amongst car sellers. When I contacted the owner's son for the first time, he told me that there were at least five more people interested in the car, so he would contact me if it was still available. Two hours later, true enough, he got in touch with me. I could come and check out the car, but I should come as soon as possible as someone else might snatch it from me. In hindsight, it sounds a bit fishy that five people came and went in a span of two hours. If you are serious about the purchase, it usually takes 40 minutes at the very least to check the car out. Oh well, it's easy to be smart after the fact. Red flag number five. I will lower the price. So you thoroughly checked the condition of the car. You went for a test drive. You are committed to buying it. It's time to talk price. It's time to talk money. I didn't find it suspicious that the seller himself started lowering the asking price. I should have found it suspicious. The seller took my job. The sellers offering to lower the price themselves could mean that they want to get rid of something ASAP, as soon as possible. Why? Because they might be aware of the problems the item has. As such, they want someone else to deal with it. Red flag number six. Post-purchase. Oh, by the way. About a week after the purchase, I got a call from the old lady. She asked me for my ID number. She needed it to fill out some paperwork. After a short exchange, she told me. Oh, by the way, Mr. Conrad, the engine bay was cleaned because I had driven a car into a knee-deep muddy puddle. In other words, the car was possibly flooded, which would explain certain issues I had with the car. And lots of leftover mud. I was lucky indeed, because the by the way could have turned out much worse. So bad that the lemon's next destination would be the nearest scrap heap. It's pretty suspicious that the lady wouldn't mention that before I bought the car from her. Some might say it's a failure to disclose vital information. In such a case, I could have demanded a price cut, or even a full refund. I didn't do any of that, of course. I wasn't planning on dragging a poor old lady through courts, even if she had intentionally kept it back from me. It became apparent that the car had loads of issues which boiled down to one cause. Negligence. You can have the most reliable car in the world, But it won't be for long if you don't take proper care of it. It's also possible to make it reliable again. But it takes time and money to make it happen. My daughter loves our lemon. As we jokingly started calling the mighty polo. She overheard me talking about it in a negative light hearing words like, oh, lemon this and lemon that, uh, and began calling it such herself, as any two-year-old would do. Monkey here, monkey do. What is also worth mentioning is that despite many shortcomings, our lemon turned out to be pretty reliable, 
even though it needed a lot of work to get to that point. It even saved our skin a few times when our primary car, a Volvo SUV, broke down. We were stranded, but our brave little polo saved us from a pickle. Was it an impulse purchase? To a degree. If I had been more patient, I would have found a better deal. Still, I was quite lucky to get it for a reasonable price before the inflation rate went through the roof, even with all the issues that needed resolving. So, before you drop a ton of cash on something, learn from my experience and consider the following. Tip number one. Don't go alone. Take a friend with you to check the car out. They don't have to be necessarily tech-savvy, even. A second pair of eyes might notice something you won't. Be it a dent, a scratch, a rust bubble, something not working and so on. I usually take my dad with me. He used to be a mechanic. He's also quite perceptive, as he always seems to know where to look for issues. Tip number two. Make a thorough inspection. You don't have to be a car mechanic to make an educated purchase. In your podcast notes, you will find two handy checklists. One in English, one in Polish. If something's fine, you put a tick. If something's wrong, you put a cross. This will help you make up your mind whether the car is in decent enough condition to purchase. Also, each cross is a point you can mention during the haggling phase. If you don't feel confident enough to inspect the car yourself, you can take it to a diagnostic center for an inspection. An honest seller won't mind. You will need to pay the man, of course, but it's better than taking your chances as I did. It also gives you an opportunity to check out the undercarriage for rust spots or any fluid leaks. Rust is especially expensive and time-consuming to get rid of. If you see any rusty holes underneath the car, it's best to leave the premises and look elsewhere. Tip number three. Do your research. If you plan to buy a second-hand car, Google common issues. That will give you some insight into what breaks down, how difficult it is to repair it yourself, how expensive it is to repair it if it's too much for you to handle. Especially with older, vintage cars, the web is chock full of forums dedicated to them. Read, ask around, learn. I wouldn't call my VW Polo vintage, even though it's 20 years old. It's a popular car, so there's a lot of information about it online. That's where knowing English came in handy. I found a particularly thorough forum thread describing the author's experience over the years with the same car, what went wrong, what he had done to mend it, and so on. All written in detail, in an accessible way. It helped me loads when repairing my lemon. Tip number four. Save some cash for the paperwork slash maintenance and repairs. So, you became a proud owner of your own lemon. I hope you haven't spent your last penny since it's not the end of your expenses. You still need to register and insure it under your name, which means dropping several slaughters at the communication department and doing the same at an insurance company. Once you've got your registration certificate and proof of purchase, you're golden. We can begin my favorite part of the post-purchase ritual. 
maintenance. The rule of thumb is to change all fluids and filters after the purchase. It's cheap, and you can do it yourself. If the previous owner had done the work, check paperwork for receipts. Despite popular opinions about different car brands, negligence can run down the most reliable car to the ground. Toyotas aren't indestructible. Hondas aren't indestructible. Volkswagens are certainly not indestructible. The same goes the other way. It's possible for the least reliable vehicle to never let you down if you look after it. Tip number five: Be willing to put in the work. At a certain age, taking the car to an authorized dealership is economically questionable. If you do that, chances are you are going to end up with a bill. Which is actually higher than what you paid for the car. Consider doing what you can yourself, just to save some cash you would otherwise pay for labor. As I mentioned earlier, all you need for the most common maintenance jobs are a couple of spanners and a jack. It's not time-consuming either. One afternoon of elbow grease, and you're done with basic maintenance. To illustrate my point, here's how you change an air filter on most cars. Step one: identify the air filter housing. Usually, it's a big black box next to the engine. Step two: undo the clips or take out the screws from the lid. Step three: take out the old air filter. Step four: put in the new air filter. Step five. Put the lid back on. That's it. To conclude, I don't want you to take my story or the podcast title too seriously. Not all grannies are evil. Only most of them are. The one I had the pleasure of dealing with was kind, honest, and forthcoming about the car. I, on the other hand, lacked experience. To ask the right questions and thoroughly inspect the vehicle before buying it. Also, it turned out not to be a complete horror story, but a valuable experience. I learned a lot more about cars by working on my own than I would if I watched YouTube videos or studied theory. As for purchasing a car. I know that I won't make the same mistakes again. You know what time it is. It's time to revise vocabulary. I will provide you with an example sentence for each word. You will hear each sentence twice. If you want translations, be sure to check out your podcast notes. Let's begin. A hood. A hood. A bonnet, a bonnet. Maska samochodu. You will find the car's engine under the hood, or the bonnet. You will find the car's engine under the hood, under the bonnet. A trunk, a trunk, or a boot. A boot. Klapa bagażnika. You will find space for your stuff under the trunk or the boot. You will find space for your stuff under the trunk or the boot. A junkyard, a junkyard, or a scrap heap, a scrap heap. Zwomowisko. When cars die, they go to the junkyard or the scrap heap. When cars die, they go to the junkyard or the scrap heap. A turn signal, a turn signal, or an indicator, 
an indicator. Kirunkovskas. If you want to change lanes, use the turn signal or the indicator. If you want to change lanes, use the turn signal or the indicator. A lemon. A lemon. Grat. Nie pochlebnie o samochodzie w złym stanie technicznym. Negligence can turn any decent car into a lemon. Negligence can turn any decent car into a lemon. Negligence can turn any decent car into a lemon. All right, that's it for today's episode. Be sure to follow me on Spotify. It really helps me reach more people with my content. Remember to subscribe to my newsletter to get notified of new episodes. If you have any questions or you just want to say hi, contact me at my email, angielskiskoradem at gmail.com.